Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stirring the Pot uh, with Florence Fabricant. We are so excited to have you here in a bit of a different format than we're used to. Um, but we're here and we're excited. Um, I want to first thank our lead sponsors of Stirring the Pot since 2014, Chufo Cabinetry. They've been with us for a very long time and we're really, really excited to have them um, still as a lead sponsor of Stirring the Pot. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, during the last five months, Florence has been getting fantastic recipes from all of our past Stirring the Pot chefs, and they're all on our website. If you go to guildhall.org slash stirring the pot at home, we have a huge litany of recipes that have been coming out once a week, um, finishing right now with the uh, most recent, which is from the beautiful cookbook that we're going to talk about today. So check out guildhall.org slash stirring the pot at home for all those recipes and also some videos of past stirring the pots. Um, I just want to also let you all know that at the end of the talk today, we will be having a Q&A on this Zoom chat. So if you open up the chat window at the bottom of your screen and type in a question when we get to the end, um, we will be answering those questions for you. So um, we have with us today, obviously, Florence Fabricant, the host and um, brain behind this series. And we also have from the Ladies Village Improvement Society, Ann Thomas, Bess Rattray, and Mary Talley. Um, and so without further ado, please enjoy Stirring the Pot. Hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me and see me. And uh, this is an interesting format, but uh, I'm looking forward to giving you a backstory and the background on the LVIS 125th anniversary cookbook that was uh, published in April and uh, without the invaluable help of the committee from LVIS, Ann Thomas, Mary Talley, Bess Rattray, and many others, this job would have not been possible for me to complete. I got involved in the uh, in the project through Guild Hall, actually, in an indirect way, because Ruth Applehoff, a former, the former executive director, um, also a member of LVIS, recommended that LVIS reach out to me to write the cookbook. And um, I didn't have a cookbook I was working on at the time, so the timing was right. And then I was uh, blessed with the most amazing committee of hard workers, recipe testers, organizers, you name it. And I'd like you to say hello to them all. Ann Thomas, hello. And Mary Talley, and Bess Rattray, who is in many ways our historian, all the wonderful yep. uh, detailed facts about the background of the village and of LVIS and the archival photos and a lot of that material would not have been possible without without having Bess. Um, let me ask you, Anne, to start. The idea of doing this cookbook, how did that evolve? Because LVIS has done so many of them over the years, I think another dozen. Yes, this is 13th. And it's your 13th cookbook as well, which I think yeah. is lovely, lovely bit of karma there. Very late in 2016, we started planning and thinking about the fact that we had this 125th anniversary coming up. And so we went to the membership with a questionnaire and asked their ideas about how they wanted to celebrate this auspicious occasion. And the number one choice, the reply was just all over the, the top for another cookbook, because this is something that hadn't been done uh, in 25 years. So we set about to, uh, I went into the archives actually, and um, uh, in doing some reading there, I found a blurb from Florence. And uh, we went back, the committee and I talked, we said, oh my goodness, Florence must know who we are. So we were thrilled about the possibility that she would even talk to us and give us some advice about how to proceed. So Ruth arranged that meeting. And uh, as always, Florence was miles ahead of us because uh, she said, well, let me put you in touch. Let's all get together with my publisher, Charles Myers at Rizzoli, 
Well, so now we think we have Florence and Rizzoli, for heaven's sakes. It doesn't get any better than that. So thinking that we had really arrived, Mary and I went to the city and had a wonderful meeting that Florence had put together with the Rizzoli folks. And when we left there, it appeared that we had a book deal. So Mary and I, floating on air, went off and had one of the most expensive lunches in history. Um, we did not expense it. We took care of that ourselves. And then rode home on the jitney, totally exhausted and thrilled. And we've been riding on Florence's coattails ever since. I mean, it's been a fabulous experience for all of us. We've learned so much. And it's been a, one opportunity after another just to widen our horizons. And it has certainly taken our 13th cookbook to the highest levels. And our cookbooks go back to 1896. I think Bess, you have a few of them there uh, in your possession. And interestingly enough, our cookbooks back then were printed in, by, the, by the star. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So you said you learned a lot. What did you oh. or members of your committee learn in doing oh. this? <laughs> Some of it can't be told. Um, <laughs> the publishing industry is just fascinating. And we, we really got into a lot of the ins and outs of how all this works. Uh, what was doubly interesting was our position in all of this, given the geopolitical situation and now the uh, the pandemic situation because this was printed in China and it was had a pub date of, and that I learned that pub date uh, the publication date of April the 7th and luckily that book got printed shipped and cleared customs before the world shut down or we would be sitting here without a book I guess um, well, you know, <laughs> the publishing business is funny. Uh, this hasn't happened to me, but I have colleagues who have gone on book tours and oh. they get to a certain destination and there are 150 people in a high school auditorium or in some other studio or theater and uh, they've checked and yes, there are boxes of books. And then when they go to open the boxes, they found biology textbooks or <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be lucky in the publishing business. The one thing I'd like to add is that the book was designed by my daughter. Yes. And this is the, I think, seventh book we've done together. And she, I don't know about how you feel. Uh, I guess Rizzoli is happy with her, but she is just a dream to work with. You need pages shuffled. You need more text, less text, caps here, not here. She knows how to do it in a twinkling. It's just amazing to me. And also the other thing that I do want to point out is not only the East Hampton star and Bess's work that has been so instrumental in making this project uh, what it turned out to be, but also the publicity that the book has gotten from the local press has been just extraordinary. I'm just so thrilled to see uh, so many publications featuring this book at this time. I, just terrific. From uh, Bookhampton on down, uh, there have been uh, not events, but certainly uh, features on, on the book. And I, it all helps because it, the book is supporting LVIS. So Bess. Yes background on LVIS, the history for those who are maybe less familiar than, than all of us. Sure. Um, well, the history of LVIS, um, it's had a lot to do with food all the way back to the late 19th century. Um, I believe that the very first uh, fundraiser the LVIS put on only a, a month after it was founded in 1895 was a supper, um, a public supper at, I think it was at Clinton Academy. So it's always been, um, had a lot to do with food. Um, would you like me to tell a little bit about the history of the cookbooks, Florence? I could show the audience some of yeah, what we it's all fascinating, and sure. it's so tied into the region. Well, and there are um, newcomers here now, so I uh, hope they're listening too. 
Yeah. Well, it's really interesting because the cookbooks um, are kind of like a social history of this area. Um, the earliest ones, this one's from 1916, and I have one from 1911 here somewhere. Um, in the early days, it was, of course, all about the traditional local foods. Unexpected things, crullers and donuts that were very popular in East Hampton. Um, it wasn't just about the seafood and the clams and the oysters. It was a lot of food traditions that were common all up and down um, the Atlantic seaboard um, because of that circular trade that you might have heard about with things like molasses and codfish um, being very prevalent here as well as in, say, Nova Scotia or in the Caribbean. So you see that in these early cookbooks, um, the things that were an everyday uh, everyday kitchen items um, here in East Hampton reflect that. Everyone had a molasses cookie. There were a lot of suet puddings, um, a lot of relishes that people made, um, traditional relishes like chow chow that they would use the fresh local produce and keep it over the winter. So um, it's really fascinating to look through these old ones if you ever have a chance. Um, a writer named Laura Donnelly, who writes about food for the East Hampton Star, asked me a few months ago to go through the old cookbooks and find ridiculous recipes from the LVIS. You know, you kind of expect it to be old cookbooks, people were reading these foolish things out of packets, you know, in the 50s. But you don't really see that in the old LVIS cookbooks. It's they're usable to this day, um, especially the very early ones have a lot of um, local produce, local fish, just as is celebrated in this new cookbook. Um, so it's interesting to see um, that a lot of these recipes stand the test of time. Um, here's my favorite page in one of my favorite LVS cookbooks from 1948. You can see how stained it is and that's because it's got my favorite recipe for a custard pie from my great great grandmother that we use to this day. Um, of course, over the years, East Hampton became more worldly. Um, people's expectation of what the cuisine might be expanded. So in the, by the 70s, there would be all kinds of international dishes in say the 1975 edition. Um, you know, it might be kedgeri or it might be uh, some curry or, an, uh, you know, something from around the world as taste expanded. Um, and um, also we had a lot of, at that time, culinary celebrities in this community, um, Craig Claiborne and Pierre Franey, as we called him, I guess it's Frenet, but we always said Franey back then. Um, so they became involved. Um, Craig Claiborne wrote the introduction to, I think it's this one, from 1975. And by that time, things were a little more sophisticated. Um, they used this beautiful beach plum print. They turned it into a, a textile that was sold by um, a high-end um, interior upholstery company in Manhattan. Um, it was turned into prints and it became sort of an emblem for the LVIS, the local beach plum. So, um, you know, as the world changed, so did the cookbooks. They weren't, um, these hokey pokey little community things that you might think. Um, you know, and today we see the reflection of the community are, we are today in the new cookbook. So it's a very diverse community. We're celebrities and we're locals and there might be a famous TV personality and there might be a fisherman, but they're all part of the fabric of the community. And I think what people have in common is this sense of appreciating the bounty of what we have here, what's grown here, what's in the seafood here. This idea of locavore was always an East Hampton thing. And you can see that in the cookbooks. And it's so beautifully done today in the new cookbook. I mean, of course, with Doug Young's incredible photos, it's just more beautiful than any of the previous cookbooks. And you can sort of get this sort of sensory feeling off his beautiful photos. Oh, yeah. I think that's, is that the clam pie? I think so. Anyway, um, there are great artifacts to look at. There, there are copies kept in the Long Island collection at the East Tenton Library. Um, and they're just really fun to look at if you're, for those who are so interested. Well, I have to say that one of the um, anecdotes for the, in the early days of assembling this cookbook and the recipes were gathered 
largely by the committee who uh, sent out an appeal far and wide, not to just their membership, but to a list of uh, local celebrities, arts figures in the arts and literature, uh, a broad base, fishermen and so forth. Um, but one of the things that I said in an early meeting is that I wanted this to be a salmon-free cookbook. <laughs> And I was serious about it because every fish market sells salmon. And yes, right now, low, uh, wild Alaska king and sockeye salmon is in season, and that's fine. But you don't need to buy salmon out here. And one of my messages I was hoping would be that there are so many other options, like, for instance, there's a recipe from Mrs. Condi Lamb. And there's a history about the Condi lamb uh, tradition and heritage in this uh, in the village, but this recipe was handed down from a couple of the other earlier cookbooks, and it was for weak fish. Now, weak fish was a fish that uh, was pretty abundant when we first started coming out here in the '60s. And then it, it's a fish that goes in cycles because then it disappeared. It's sort of been back this year, but you could use other fish like fluke or flounder or uh, even cod in that recipe. The fish are pretty interchangeable, but you've got weak fish, you've got monkfish, you've got striped bass, you've got black bass. You really don't need salmon. <laughs> so that was one of the little things. But I have to say, <laughs> committee's work in uh, helping to assemble the recipes and test many of them was amazing. And also uh, addressing what Bess had to say, there are a couple of recipes. There's a, pickle, there's a pepper relish that uh, was in several previous cookbooks that I brought into this one because it was so good and used it to adapt uh, the recipe from the palm for steak a la stone. Instead of just peppers on the plate, I suggested the relish and the relish really works. It's a great condiment to keep in your fridge. And there are just so many stories about some of these recipes and uh, how we got them and testing them. Uh, it was, and it was also getting to know each other, which was part of the fun project. Yes. Mary and, and Anne and so forth. Um, in terms of, um, you said learning so much. And the, you know, what you learn in terms of the cooking. And in as far as bringing a book up to date and making it contemporary, um, I think that wasn't hard because you can see the evolution of the uh, the way food is addressed in this region throughout the history of the LDIS cookbooks. And also here, we've tried to point out when a recipe has taken part in that tradition. I think you showed the photo of the clam pie. Well, yeah. a particular pet of mine because um, I always, loved clam pie and there used to be uh, clam pies for sale in a number of places and that fell off I guess the taste for clam pie sort of evolved out of the the picture but uh, I was determined to do a clam pie and I tried several recipes from previous LVIS cookbooks and there was always a little something that I wanted to tweak so I did a kind of mashup and the recipe that's in this book is my own. It doesn't have potatoes in it, although I think the stylist did put potatoes into the, into the picture or into the recipe that was photographed. But that's fine, you can do that. And um, I recommend you try it because it's really, it may be a throwback, but it's really delicious. What are some of your favorite recipes, Mary? Because I know that uh, you've tried a number of them. I have tried a lot of them and they've all been just wonderful and the only bomb that I've done is the strawberry shortcake. My biscuits were like hockey pucks, but other than that, everything has been perfect. Um, 
I only have one person that I'm testing them on, and that's my husband. I have taken a few samples of some things to Ann that I've tried, like the Benny Bits. And yes. probably at the top of our list is the uh, oven fried chicken, which we just had last night. Um, I, I love that recipe so much. And another favorite of mine is the fruit crisp. Um, I've been making it with uh, South Carolina peaches from local farm stands. And um, it's, it's just delicious. I think that um, there's such a great variety in this book, but one of the things about trying the recipes out is I find that the directions are so good. I mean, it's, there's nothing left to chance. And I'm, I'm one of these cooks that likes to measure everything. I don't like to do a little bit of this or a little bit of that. So I found the directions to be really helpful and it makes you have a great outcome with whatever you're preparing. Um, Another thing that I really enjoyed making was the melon gazpacho. Uh, it is amazing what that gazpacho tastes like and how little effort it takes. Um, that's, that's an amazing recipe. Um, the other thing that I, I like about this book besides just trying the recipes is just reading the book. Yes. Um, I, I buy cookbooks where I don't even use them to cook, just to read. There it is, oven fried chicken. <laughs> Mine looked just like that. Ha ha. <laughs> making it tonight. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the book is a joy to read, and um, I will have to compliment Bess again on the history in the book. It's well worth reading. It, it's just a great background of LVIS and East Hampton. Well, in terms of the precision of the recipes, I'm of two minds. Uh, Pino Luongo, an Italian cook and restaurateur, uh, who used to have the restaurant uh, Coco Pazzo that was at, oh, wow. at uh, the intersection of Wainscott Stone Road and the highway, that house on the pond that's been many restaurants before and since. Uh, he wrote a cookbook with no measurements because he cooks like that. And he said, you've got to learn to cook like that. Just cook by feel, cook by taste, and so forth. That's the way I like to cook. But I've learned from experience I cannot do that because if I want to capture a recipe for future use, I have to know what I did rather than have it be a one-off that disappears because I don't remember I didn't measure anything. But the precision of these recipes, which is pretty much the way cookbooks and recipes are written for today's audience, uh, we have to thank Eliza Fogelson, who really held our feet to the fire in terms of nailing down the exact quarter teaspoon of this and 15 minutes in, in an oven of that. Uh, she was uh, a hard taskmaster, but the results from what Mary said were, were well worth it. Um, and so you have a kind of a sense of both because for all of the recipes, I've added what I call an improvement. It's a play on the name of the organization, but it is also an extra hint, an extra tip. And very often those are not given in measurements, but just as ideas or concepts. And, um, you know, what I'd like you to do, both Mary and uh, Anne and also Bess, is go into, uh, for our audience, what were some of the things that you've had planned for uh, this cookbook and have been postponed and what you hope we can do with it coming up uh, when perhaps the rules of social distancing and mask wearing and everything else uh, might be loosened because the virus has responded to a uh, popular effort? Um, quite frankly, uh, we, I think we've done a pretty good job of marketing this book under the, the conditions that we've had to market it. Uh, the LVI shops were closed when the book came out on April 7th. Um, and we managed to sell within two months 500 books. And the way that we did that is, um, Anne brought the books to her house, it became our distribution center. We had other members of the committee that were into the shipping. They would haul stacks of books to the post office and we were shipping all across the country. Um, so 
once the shops opened up, our books are now available for, at, the, at the shops, or you can also go to our website, lbis.org. And on that website, there's an option to click on a book. And when you do that, it will have an option to buy the book. And if you buy that book today on our website, you will get a signed copy of the book by Florence. And the reason this is so significant is we had scheduled book signings with Florence in celebration of this book, and they all got postponed. Right, Anne? That's right. Not canceled. Postponed. Not canceled. Postponed. <laughs> they will, we will return. But um, if you buy your book today, just go online. Uh, you have options of uh, shipping it, uh, delivering, or even pick up at the LVIS shops at 95 Main Street in East Hampton. Or I deliver. Or Anne delivers. Or I deliver. And again, that offer, I sound like a commercial, that offer is only for today. So get your book today. <laughs> yeah, I remember Anne had suggested one idea that was going to happen at the summer fair in July was we were going to have a beautiful booth um, wrapped in images from the cookbook and uh, we were going to have some maybe junior members, young women, um, serving samples from the cookbook and uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we're able to do that next year fingers crossed we, we will do that next year and we also will have this uh, 125th anniversary celebration going on into next year which had always been planned anyway it was going to be with the kickoff of this year's fair and it will come culminate in next year's fair but now we're going to do it all in one fair next year so we'll be back <laughs> yeah uh, let me ask you about the um, the makeup of the committee because um, mm -hmm. there were five or six members of LVIS on the committee for the cookbook. Uh, did you get many volunteers or was it like pulling teeth? Uh, how did that work? Ooh, that's a real good question, Florence. We really started very small and stayed that way. I think that was one piece of advice you gave us right off the bat, that we really didn't need a large committee. And so we were sort of handpicked um, for areas of expertise. Mary's our PR chair. Bess is, is our historian and our link to all kinds of beautiful archival photos and interesting history and stories about East Hampton. And uh, uh, Barbara Lambert and Afton DeSuno. We were really, and Bonnie Reese Smith, we were a very small group, and I think that's why we accomplished as much as we did, because there were not endless meetings. We were working. We were working, and there were many Sundays, speaking of Eliza, who I think is on the, on the wire here, um, there were many Sunday afternoons that we sat around either Florence's table in her kitchen or Bess's table and worked for three and four hours. And you can't do that with a group of 20 people. So there were three and four of us going through all of this with a fine tooth comb. And, and as Florence said earlier, Eliza had our feet to the fire. So God bless her, because as I said earlier, we're just lucky to have this book in this environment. And if we had dawdled and not met our deadlines, hard as they seemed, um, I, don't, I don't know that we would have had a published, a finished product uh, by this date. And also the, the way that, that we ended up with Doug Young was a very thought out process. Um, yeah. There were lots of people that we were looking at and, um, and pretty much when we got Doug, we knew we had the person that was meant for oh. this. He's, he's very likely to work with. The advantages of working with Doug, not only his talent, but also the fact that he was very familiar with the locality. Yes. And uh, he really knew what um, uh, what there was to photograph here. He started very early on, uh, out of season, if you will, which is why we were able to get photographs of uh, buildings in the snow and landscapes in spring and fall and so forth uh, to spread throughout the book. The idea of doing it for seasonal menus was not the original concept necessarily. Um, it makes a cookbook much, much more difficult to do 
it's much easier to just group your appetizers, your main courses, your desserts, um, and have chapters like that, which we could have done, but the seasonality of what's available here and what the landscape is here and how uh, the year evolves with the farming and the fishing and the changes in what can be harvested at different times almost demanded a look at seasons. And so we did decide fairly early on to group recipes according to the seasons and then to do that, menus sort of fell in place. But that was a real juggling act because um, sometimes there'd be a recipe for something that that was really great and just didn't seem to fit into any particular menu. Or perhaps we had a menu that just needed potato salad in <laughs> my, which is one of the one of my favorite things anyway. But Bonnie Rice Smith came through with her potato salad. We didn't have a potato salad recipe. The other um, requirement that I made was that none of the recipes come from previously published works. There are a few exceptions, like Ina Garten contributed a recipe from one of her books. So that was uh, different. But when the members or other contributors gave us recipes, I tried to make sure that they were not recipes that had been published in another book or a magazine or a newspaper. Uh, if they were published previously in an LDIS cookbook, that was fine because that's part of the tradition. But we were not in the business of republishing recipes from lots of different books and things. It meant getting permissions and it got, it would get very, very complicated. But it was a real juggling act and every one of the menus, we all sat down with all the, we had a list of the recipes and fitting them pieces into this puzzle. And a lot of those committee meetings were devoted to doing that just that to say, hey, wouldn't these cookies be good in this menu and so forth? And that's kind of how it worked out. And uh, as I say, it's sometimes a menu cookbook is easier for the cook and the reader. But I have to tell you, for, for the people who are writing and editing, it's a nightmare. <laughs> And, you know, there's still stuff that I wish we could have included, but we had to cut it off at, at some point or other. Um, the other thing that we ran into, or I ran into, is recipes that came from previous LVIS cookbooks where there were no real measurements, or it would tell you yeah. the measurements of the ingredients, but not what size pan to use, or not what oven, what oven temperature you needed. And, those kinds of details which were required and that's often where the committee came in and I would say how well, I need to know whether uh, you use an A or a B size loaf pan for this recipe because we can't run it without knowing and that's so funny I wanted me? to add a uh... Florence, that that's something when I've worked with the old cookbooks has been very amusing because I want to learn how to make old fashioned East Hampton donuts, but the recipe will say a cup sugar, you know, a cup flour, a cup yeast, boil in hot lard. What? A cup <laughs> yeah. What? Is this some homemade yeast, like a sourdough? What are they talking about? So, you know, that's really funny in the old books. And it's also great to see that progression over time to such a really easily usable cookbook that we have today, you know, full Well, also in the old days, they would use measurements like a wine glass and a cup often meant a teacup, but what do they mean by a teacup? Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, frequently you'd see butter the, the size of, an, uh, of a walnut. That was a frequent measurement. Yes. And you kind of have to wing it, but you know, once you've got experience in particularly baking, but also in cooking and knowing how long it takes for stuff to to be done and and roughly the ingredient amounts that you need, it becomes easier. 
Uh, the one thing I try and do is think like a shopper. In other words, if I want to make a recipe, I have to go to the market and buy X, Y, and Z. I want the recipe to tell me, not to tell me a cup of shelled peas, because I don't buy shelled peas. I buy peas in the pod from the farm stand, and I want to know how many pounds of peas I need in order to get my cup of shelled peas. And uh, I tried that, to do that in every instance. So people who, have to, who want to prepare the recipes would know exactly what they had to buy and, and not do a lot of guesswork. And, uh, you know, I think it's helpful for people. It's the way I like to cook and shop. I'll go into a market. To me, it's more important to know what I need to buy in a way than to know um, uh, how many cups of this or that. I can always adjust that. But I, knowing what I need to buy, I think is an important uh, tactic. And very often cookbooks neglect that in my view. I hope, you know, this pleases, this approach pleased you on, on this book. It certainly helped me when I was making these recipes. Um, the other thing I liked about the, the uh, items in the recipes is you gave choices. For example, if there was something not available at the market during that time, you gave an opportunity to find something else that would work in that recipe. And I found that to be very helpful. Well, that's part of a learning curve also. Like I said, with the fish there, I mean, you don't cook cod the way you would cook salmon but there are lots of other options when you go to the market. Um, if I'm making dinner for other people, which someday I'll start doing again, uh, <laughs> I don't go with a fixed idea. I usually, a fixed recipe, I usually go with a, with a concept. And if my concept includes local swordfish and there is none, or I don't like what I see in the market, I pivot and figure out something else that looks appealing or I'll go into the market with no idea and all of a sudden there'll be an ingredient that I hadn't even thought of, but look at how wonderful. I mean, I was at Balsam Farms the other day and I bought Lovage. I haven't bought Lovage in a long time. And if you don't know, Lovage is a, a spiky leafy herb that is very much in terms of aroma and flavor like celery. Now, oh. Celery is a great ingredient for the flavor, but I find that a big head of celery with all those stalks doesn't get used up that much in my house. And as a result, having lovage on hand, if I want a little of that celery flavor, you can chop some lovage in with your onions and garlic and tomatoes and whatever you're doing as the base for, I don't know, pasta sauce or a stew or some dish uh, soup or some dish like that, uh, lovage is great if you can get it. And I, I felt fortunate that I found it and I used it. So um, you, I think the idea of going into the market um, is a really important one. I started writing about food out here actually for the East Hampton Star back in 1972 mainly out of frustration because I would see people in the middle of the summer in the supermarkets buying cellophane wrapped heads of iceberg lettuce and tomatoes that looked like plums because they were pink and hard. Uh, and I said to myself, don't these people know if they just go around the corner like the, the farm, the little co uh, card table, you don't even call it a farm stand on Cedar, where Cedar Street meets North Main, people coming out of the IGA with plastic wrap iceberg lettuce when they could go to that stand and buy practically everything they need for dinner, it would drive me nuts. And so I proposed to Everett Rattray, the uh, uh, editor of the Star at the time, uh, a food column. And lo and behold, I started doing it and wound up writing for the time six months later, and uh, never looked back. But the genesis of the, my whole career, in a way, was cooking and eating out in East Hampton. 
uh, I was talking with a potato farmer uh, with Dean Foster, who with his sister Mary Lee up in Sagaponic are now distilling vodka and some other, they do a, a wonderful cucumber vodka, by the way, with their own cucumbers. Um, and talking about the days when their farm was uh, harvesting potatoes that they would ship to Russia and Puerto Rico in the 70s. And I would tell him about how, well, what, after the tractors, the harvesters went through the fields and picked up the potatoes they would leave these little golf ball sized beauties in the field to just rot because they didn't, they couldn't use those for the shipments they required. And we'd go with the kids and pick up potatoes and have those with dinner. And, and, and he said, yeah, but before too long, we realized we could get more money for those than for the, the big crop. And we could no longer let people do that. And we, developed a harvester that would pick those up too. And it was kind of funny because I remember those days so well. We'd, we'd get the potatoes and in those days you could harvest the crabs from Georgia Capon. And that was dinner, crabs and potatoes, fresh from the field and fresh from the it's Hard to do today. Do any of you grow your own? Mary or Anne or uh, I don't have room. I'd love to. No, I don't grow it. I have a, a pot of basil. <laughs> I, I got um, I got inspired to do some vegetables this year based on all the talk about the Victory Gardens, but I got uh, beat up by the raccoons, so that went by the wayside. <laughs> I see. Lawrence, I yeah. do not so much grow your own, but uh, fish your own. I grew up in a household doing just what oh. you describe. We always have blue claw crabs. Uh, we always do hull seining on the beach with a hand hull sane every summer. Get the little white bait and fry them right on the beach. We used to get those from Georgica Pond too and just yeah. fry. So we do a lot of fishing and clamming and steamers. And we, every, you know, everybody in their family has a secret spot for steamers or hard clams or that kind of thing. And that's how we grew up as well, you know, um, so. I love hearing you describe that. The steamers this year, the local steamers have been beyond wonderful. They have, the shells are paper thin. The size is quite modest, which is what I prefer. And we can't stop eating them. They're just mm -hmm. fabulous. And some years they're not so great or not so plentiful. It's, uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, what is available and, and what you can get. Yeah, I've observed it's interesting, even though um, the town seems so much more crowded, obviously it is, than it was 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. There are so many more people here. You don't really see more people out getting, say, steamers, for example. So it's something if you've got a permit, a shellfish permit, you can still do, and it's still available to you, all those, you know, clams and such. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Have you ever gotten razor clams? I have, but I haven't tried eating one, I don't think, ever. You need kids when uh, you're doing this so that um, you can put them to work for you. Otherwise, it's not something you want to do on your own, really. Yeah. You know, I've put the kids to gathering beach plums, and that's another thing that some years they're plentiful, and, and usually we go around um, Albert's... Um, landing road at the end near the Devon Yacht Club. Those bushes are usually fairly plentiful. Also in the walking dunes and there are cranberries around the air and around there. And one year in Hither Hills, we found chanterelle. And I am not somebody who's going to eat wild mushrooms that I've picked in a hurry. But these were so clearly chanterelle. And I consulted with a chef and he said, those, those will be fine. And we're still here. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole bunch of, of oyster mushrooms growing on a tree stump in, in, uh, at the edge of my driveway, and they look so wonderful, but I'm not, I, I don't think I dare it. In France, you can take mushrooms you've gathered into a pharmacy, and there's always somebody oh. licensed, not in Paris so much, but in the country, somebody in that pharmacy who is licensed to tell you whether or not the mushrooms you, you have are edible. And you know, what a wonderful thing that is. It's so interesting. One of the things that comes up a lot in early LVIS cookbooks is uh, Montauk grapes. 
And it's, you know, people would go out on Montauk on a day expedition at the turn of the century or in the 20s to pick Montauk grapes and make jelly and uh, jelly out of them, not jam. And um, I loved how the beach plum theme came through in the latest cookbook. And it comes all the way through all the history of the LVIS cookbooks, how beach plums were really uh, an essential, like almost a hallmark of local cuisine. And that's why I love the the old print that they made into a fabric in the 70s of the beach plums. It's just uh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the things at the LVIS fair you could always count on you got there early enough buying a jar of beach plum jam or jelly. Rosita. Yep. Rosita yep. Medler. Yep. Jennifer, how are we doing with questions? Because we have about 15 or so minutes left. Yeah, we can definitely start taking questions. We do have one um, right now from Mary Jane Brock who wants to know where do you buy your steamers? I guess if you're not going to get them yourself. Well, I've been buying them at the seafood shop, but there's also uh, a family up Abraham's path. Uh, if you go north from the Montauk Highway, they're on the left past the railroad and so forth. And there's a sign that says, I think it says steamers. No, it says scallops. They've got sea scallops now, but they also from time to time have steamers and they have blackfish and uh, at really good prices. I mean, they're local fishermen. I think it may be part of the Lester family. Mm -hmm. yes, I have another tip for that, actually. Um, something that came up during the pandemic is some local fishermen started selling um, sort of roadside style, and I've been getting yeah. seafood from some local places. For example, there's a guy, I think it's from a guy from the Verity family, who he started at the commercial dock in East Hampton, um, selling clams and steamers. And now he's, um, I think it's Cozy Cabins, one of the, ca mm -hmm. the, the cabins um, as you're coming into Wainscot. And mm -hmm. there's a very small sign that says clams. And he's had steamers and clams and they're wonderful. They're often from that day, um, very affordable. And it's one of these funny thing that's happened during the pandemic is actually a little bit more access to local food, which has been a silver lining. Well, it works a lot of different ways because, um, you know, with the restaurants largely closed or open only and partially, uh, the restaurant suppliers have become uh, uh, stressed because these accounts they could no longer sell to. And so you have the big restaurant suppliers coming out from New York and delivering to homes here. And at the same time, some local suppliers like Dock's Dish and some of the oyster farms that previously only sold to restaurants uh, are selling to consumers. And uh, the consumers are reach, reaping the benefit of this. Yes, Montauk Pearls, the company that sells the Montauk Pearl oysters, I believe are delivering. Uh, how nice is that? Yeah, there are a number of them that are delivering, which is really great. You have to know how to open an oyster or you can bake it open. Um, I find opening clams so much easier than opening oysters. I don't know about you, Bess. Um, I have to struggle for both of them. I will do it. I will open oysters about twice a year, <laughs> Thanksgiving and maybe a birthday. There's um, a beautiful family operation in Montauk that's also a bayman who gets um, his own seafood and they will open the oysters for you and let me get the name of it. I think it's Montauk shellfish, but let me check because they're in Montauk. You go to their house, they'll sell you beautiful fresh seafood and they will open for you. So let me get that, get that number while we're talking. Get so any other um, people who are watching right now, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat and we will ask. It. Yeah, I think Opening oysters is a little riskier. I use a mesh, metal mesh glove on the hand that holds the oyster because it's easy for your knife to slip. Whereas opening a clam, um, most instructions for opening clams don't really tell you what you, you really need to know. Um, you can't just force the knife in, which is what they tell you. You, you hold the knife in your dominant hand and position it 
at the seam at the top of the clam where the shells would part. And then with the hand holding the clam, you force the knife using the fingers of that hand around the knife to push it in between the shells. It's a little hard to describe without seeing it. And I don't think we've got a, a video for it, but that's the way it should be done. And that makes it easy. My dad said it was like turning, um, turning a, lock, uh, a key in a lock because you would slip it in there and click until it clicked at that hinge. Yeah, but you can't, you have to push it in with the hand hold, push the knife in with fingers of the hand holding the clam because you cannot, you don't have enough force in your hand holding the knife to do it. At least I don't. So I found the name, name. Can I say, sorry. Hey, go ahead. Um, Bennett Shellfish in Montauk is another wonderful local operation that uh, has a beautiful sanitary kitchen that's all approved by the health department, but it's uh, an actual bayman actually bringing it to his home and um, it's shellfish and seafood and also will open for you. That's great. We have another question, uh, which is how do you think the pandemic will change the way we gather and entertain? And why is this book uniquely suited for whatever that looks like? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Right now, the pandemic has certainly affected the way we've gathered and entertained. We don't entertain more than two people at a time, and we do it entirely outdoors. I haven't let anybody into my house except for maybe a quick run to a restroom. But um, by and large, it's only been outside, and it's been largely drinks and nibbles, although we've done some dinners as well. And once it gets darker earlier and colder. I don't know where we'll go with entertaining or where I'll go with entertaining. It's going to depend on the state of things. Uh, most of my friends won't, I mean, we haven't even gone out to eat anywhere, even outdoors. So, and most of my friends are not taking risks. Uh, we, we know a couple of couples who haven't even left their homes. Um, and for future, I think that as soon as it's going to be possible to gather in larger groups or to have it be safe to gather indoors, people who like to entertain are going to jump in with, you know, in spades because we miss it so. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how we eat, I have a feeling the pandemic has made people who were non-cooks into cooks. Yes. In some cases, I also think that the reliance on deliveries from a wide assortment of sources, restaurants and caterers and you name it, I think that is going to stay with us. And I think the one um, problem will be for supermarkets because there will be so many other sources for good food that uh, the amount of time you have to spend in the supermarket will diminish. Uh, but, you know, it's a huge question mark. Who knows? Hope that answers it. And in terms of the book, there are a lot of dinners for two and four or lunches or other uh, uh, possible uh, food uh, occasions that are suitable for small groups. Plus, great many of the recipes can be reduced, can be scaled down easily enough. Or you wind up with leftovers. I found that uh, what I've been doing with leftovers, you, I cannot name the soups I've concocted. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a question, but we have a comment from Steve who says that he's been to many stirring the pots and he's been loving the Zoom and that you all look very relaxed. <laughs> I'm a nervous wreck. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a quick question, actually. So you mentioned Florence, you mentioned Balsam Farms and, and the stand on Cedar Street. What other places out here um, do you like to get your produce, local places? Oh, I shop around. I, the easiest for me is Bill and Lisa's in Wainscott. And right now, their corn is fabulous. And I've been also 
buying their peaches, which are hard as a rock when you buy them, but give them three days sitting out and they'll be fine. And they are really wonderful. Um, I pick up stuff, I'll go to Pike, depending on the traffic, because his tomatoes are always very reliable. Um, I only wish he were organic. I wish more of the farms were organic. That's my one, the one reason I'll go way out of my way to balsam uh, is because they're organic. And uh, it's important to me, I think it's important for the land. It's not just a matter of what I'm eating, but what is happening to the soils and the other, uh, uh, and all of the wildlife, the birds and animals that live off this land. Uh, how they are affected, as we know, by the application of chemicals. And I know that the farmers out here have decreased their amount of usage and that the term organic is extremely elastic, but at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a place to start. And uh, I think it's, it's, uh, and I think it's important. Uh, I Iacono chickens or I'll buy um, chickens from the, uh, eggs from the North Fork of Browders is the farm up there. Uh, there are so many sources and part of it depends on where I am. So I don't have to go hugely out of my way. What about you, Mary or Anne or, or Bess? Where do you get produce? I well, I'm right down the road from Balsam. And um, so I'm, I go there free, frequently and there's another little hidden gem farm stand that very few people know about, so I'm just going to blow my source here and uh, mention <laughs> Spring Clothes Nursery. Oh, um, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a very small operation, but uh, amazing produce. Um, I'm, I'm, I, one thing that I'm having a little trouble with is I like to pick out my own produce. Yes. And because of the pandemic, a lot of uh, farm stands have changed the process. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're getting creative about it, but I still like to pick out my own. Two of my favorite places still that you do that, and yeah. that's uh, Babinski's in Wainscott, and also the Dayton Farm Stand at 114 and Stephen Hand's Path. They do it all in a very orderly way, but you get to touch your own veggies, yeah. and be surprised when you get home. I think this year Dayton it has less variety, and mm -hmm. uh, why? But I don't find it as abundant and interesting as they've been in the past. Although their, their peaches are good, I don't, they say they're local um, and their corn is always good and their yes. tomato. But balsam where you are confronted with a, like a server behind a counter picking out everything for you is, is kind of less appealing these days. Yes. I yes. had a thought, Florence, when you mentioned Iaconos, the chicken farm on Long Lane, Across the street is Share the Harvest Farm, which is a wonderful oh, yes. organization yeah. that supplies food pantries. But they are actually now doing delivery in with in East Hampton in a local zone. You can get um, a CSA box from them, or you can order corn or tomatoes or what have you, which I think is a wonderful resource for people who are not leaving the house. So Share the Harvest Farm on Long Lane, they're a great organization to support because they get local produce to the food pantries. Um, and it's also a nice source uh, if, if, you, if you want delivery of stuff grown right there. I like that you mentioned the food pantries, Bess. I think it's very, very uh, important to note how our, our local farms are supporting these food pantries um, and farm stands. I know that Vicky's Veggies in Amagansett has a drive-through right now but they're huge with the East Hampton Pantry. And yeah. during these times, it has been really amazing to see the need has like tripled. Yeah, well, there are two things though about that because I got a lot of produce from somebody early on and I wanted to donate it because it was much more than I could possibly consume. I wanted to donate it to one of the food pantries and I was told they only want cash. Oh. And I finally twisted their arm. I said, look, I have this box. I mean, it was a big box of kale and carrots and all kinds of stuff. And they were going to turn it away. And I said, that's ridiculous. Somebody's got to 
need this, want this. But the whole CSA program, now you find that some restaurants are doing what amounts to a CSA on a weekly or monthly basis. You sign up for a subscription and they'll send you a box of which may have produce, but will also have other ingredients, their homemade pasta perhaps, or some kind of condiments and whatnot. And, you know, if you like that kind of thing, it's, uh, it's a way to support the restaurants. I have another comment and question here from Janine. She says, thank you for this book. It's a beautiful gift to all of us. Her question is, did you have many submitted recipes that couldn't make it into the book? Might be fun for LVIS to send those out. <laughs> well, Mary and, Mary and I both have a recipe that's on the cutting room floor. We couldn't get a recipe in the that. book to save our lives. <laughs> well, Before Florence knew who I was, I, we were sitting at the table sorting through recipes and Florence picked up one and she said, pudding, evaporated milk? I don't think so. Well, I knew that was my recipe. <laughs> I don't know what was on the cutting room floor. I imagine I have a file of them. Um, and most of them were, there was a flaw of some kind or other that made them unacceptable, like too much canned soup that I couldn't uh, <laughs> somehow uh, surmount or uh, it was just too much of a duplication. I mean, we had many, many, many recipes for quiche and there's one in the book. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. And it's an excellent one, by the way. Zucchini yes, and sausage. Yeah. Jennifer, would yes. you share this information that Patricia Stein Redden sent in? She's yes. given you the, uh, the Bennett shellfish number in Montauk. Yes, Patricia seconded what Beth said, Bennett shellfish in Montauk. Um, their phone number is in the chat. Everyone, oh, it's only to panelists, so you can't see it. Uh, if everyone has a pen and you want to write this down, Bennett shellfish phone number is 631-903-5817. Or if you didn't get that, you can email jennifer at guildhall.org and I'll send it to you. We did also just have one comment from Eliza Fogelson who said, I have made Uncle Bo's blueberry muffins 10 times. <laughs> there is a recipe I would have loved to have included, but I didn't know it existed until a couple of weeks ago. There's a new little prepared food shop called Silver Spoon. Yes. Right near the way. And the one thing that I'm taken with that they sell are edamame dumplings. They're uh, a Chinese, like they look like pot stickers. It's a fried dumpling, but not deep fried. And you can warm them in the oven and they need a, a nice soy and rice wine and ginger kind of dipping sauce. But it's a dumpling, well-made dumpling filled with edamame and really a delicious little hors d'oeuvre. I would have loved to have included that recipe because I know there are farmers out here that are, are growing edamame. So when's the next cookbook coming? Uh, no idea. Bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have one more question from Andrea Grover, our executive director. She says, the relationship between Guildhall and LVIS has always existed. LVIS had a booth in the theater at our grand opening in August of 1931. Do you think that the two organizations were born out of the same civic impulse? Guildhall also had a cookbook called Palette to Palette that we'd like to revive. Hint, hint, Florence. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, that's for the LVIS group to answer. Yeah, do you think Guildhall and LVIS were born out of the same kind of civic spirit? Community spirit. Yes, well, I think you have an answer too. No, I think you have, if, if I can jump in here, uh, LVIS had a particular mandate yes. and that in terms of the physical, maintaining the, 
what's physically not just beautiful, but viable and important in the village and surrounds. Um, Guildhall, Guildhall's mission was, and it, for LVIS, it was for people, both local and visitors, to appreciate the physical surroundings. For Guildhall, it was more our minds and our intellects and our cultural uh, well-being that uh, their mandate seemed to have been addressing and always has. Unlike some of the other local cultural institutions, Guildhall is so multifaceted, which is, I think, what sets it apart. And is Guildhall uh, celebrating its 90th this coming year, I believe? Yes, 90th in 2021. Okay. I was going to add that I think it's true what Andrea says. People who live in East Hampton are particularly devoted to the community and feel very involved and invested in preserving what's good about it and um, celebrating what we have that's special here. I think that is kind of an unusual attitude, just how invested in being from East Hampton people are and you see that with the LVIS um, you know that people want to spend their free time improving the village preserving what's great about it and you certainly see it in the founding of Guild Hall which was meant to be a, a real gathering place to bring it was very idealistic in the early years um, and is today of course but it was an idea of bringing all facets of community together um, to elevate the whole town. So I do think there's a certain spirit there of just civic involvement that isn't necessarily that common or that common anymore. I wish a lot more people realize that it's a message that deserves to be broadcast far and wide. I'm leafing through the cookbooks because I was trying to find one of the charming Guild Hall ads in the cookbooks. They all featured um, because they were printed at the star they all had these adorable ads from local businesses that are really fun to look at and looking through you can still see the names of existing local businesses white's pharmacy uh yardley and pino um cook agency you know it's fun to see that continuity i can't write off find some of the guild hall ones but they're very charming and you can see that partnership and all the cultural institutions of the town the star Guildhall, the library, the LVIS, those are kind of like pillars of this community and they've always been intertwined. So it's fun to see in the cookbooks that reflected. I wanna remind everyone who is watching here that if you don't have this cookbook, honestly, you really want this cookbook. Um, if you buy it today, like Mary was saying, at the LVIS website, Florence will sign it for you and will deliver it to you or you can pick it up. Um, so- And give it as gifts. It's yeah. holiday time coming. Send it to people you love. <laughs> Don't miss out. I also want to let everyone know that we will um, have two more Stirring the Pot Zoom talks this summer. Uh, information on them will be very soon sent out via email and on the Guild Hall website, but one in late August and one in September. Terrific. Yeah, I want to thank everybody who, are in, who was involved in producing this and making it possible because we discussed a number of options for how to create stirring the pot with the pandemic. And uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed this and I look forward to having you uh, in the audience uh, for the next session and, uh, and beyond. And I wanna thank uh, Jennifer and Patrick at Guild Hall for their technical expertise and um have a great rest of the day it's a gorgeous day thank you florence and guild hall it's an opportunity for us we sure appreciate it what an honor thank you yes for letting us be a part of it thank you everyone thank you guild hall take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.